Coming up on this week's Motor Week, Richard Hammond has a dual test with two offerings from Germany, the BMW 318i and the Mercedes C-Class. Ken Gibson is being chauffeured in and is driving the latest luxury car from Swedish manufacturer Volvo, the S80 Executive. Rob Hallam's had the opportunity to test the latest BMW M3 in the south of France and he'll be seeing if it compares to the first and second generation. And Glenda Mackay has another dual test for us, this time with the Nissan Primera versus the Hyundai Elantra. In the 1980s, the BMW M3 was seen as one of the ultimate enthusiast cars and it was pretty much unstoppable in its class on the track. But then in the 90s, the M3 was more associated with a means of transport for estate agents and bank managers. Well now, BMW have combined the edge and aggression of the first car with the power and comfort of the second to produce the all-new BMW M3. Straight away you can see in the mean business with the new car, 18-inch wheels under flared arches, gorgeous bonnet bulge housing the all-new engine, huge front air dam and those M5-esque exhaust pipes. And if that doesn't tell you this is an M car, there's a lovely little M3 badge on these retro engine vents. Now a few years ago, if you'd have said to me that I'd be driving the latest BMW M3 in the south of France, I'd have laughed at you. And why? Well, I used to be an estate agent, so I would have then gone to try and sell you a mortgage. But that's all in my past now, and the Lord above has finally forgiven me. But I wonder what I would have made of the car all those years ago. Hmm. Right then, sir, madam, you know what as estate agent say, location, location, and location, that's what it's all about. And I think you'll agree that this BMW looks superb in any location. Nice plot for some uh, development work there. Anyway, moving through to the interior. As sir and madam can no doubt see, there's ample living space and we've retrimmed all your furnishings in this lovely red leather. Now I have heard a few comments that say this interior is a little bit dull, but I'll tell you what you can do if you can live with that, I'll throw in a full set of carpets for you. So I think you'll agree, a cracking option there, even for the first time buyer. Oh, isn't that a neoclassical Georgian lean to with a hint of Victoriana? I think it is. Take a few quid there. Has he gone? I thought I got rid of him years ago. notice when you drive this car is the noise or more importantly the engine note when you put your foot down that is absolutely superb and exactly how a sports car should sound really lets you know you're driving something a little bit special now up front there's an all-new 3.2 litre straight six engine producing over 340 brake horsepower and as you'd expect massive amounts of torque and that pull has really got to be felt to be believed it's fantastic Now, although you'll have most of your fun in this car with the needle up on the red line, it will pull you around town in sixth gear all day long. Now, as well as the new engine, we've also got a new suspension system. It's stiffer, it's a wider track front and rear, and it sits lower than the previous car. And that makes for an absolutely superb, very stable ride and there's bags of grip. And this model now also comes with traction control, which you can switch off, but that allows the less experienced driver to still reap the benefits of all that performance. Now, 0 to 60 time on the M3 is a staggering 4.8 seconds which is even more impressive when you consider that this car is actually heavier than the model it replaces. Now with all that power and weight, I know what you're thinking, it's gonna be able to stop. Well, this car will actually outbreak most supercars and you'll get from 60 to zero in, hey, in a very impressive 2.6 seconds. Hello, oh, can you let me out, please? I thought I got rid of him last time. Oh, no. Now then, whilst it might be a little bit dark in here, it's certainly not too cramped and that's another fantastic selling feature you're getting practicality with performance now sir and madam if you'd like to have a look on the interior we've got hey what i think that's known as being gazumped 
Now there's no doubt that this new M3 impresses at every step of the way, with its looks, with its sound and with the way it handles, but it's also very impressive in the price department because at 38 and a half grand, well, it's pitched alongside the likes of the Lotus Exige and the Audi S4. But if you look at the performance figures, whoa, it's right up there with the Porsche Carreras and the Lotus Esprit. Believe it or not, people ask me, do I regret leaving the estate agents? What do you think? If I had to ask you what you think of Volvo, I guarantee most of you would say green wellies, big baggy jumper, big, big practical boxy estates. Well, you're living in the past because this is the posh new face of Volvo. From the outside, the S80 is genuine road presence. It's a big car with bold lines that looks decidedly different than the German crowd. The front is unquestionably Volvo, but I like the flowing lines of the boot best. It looks like no other car on the road. Volvo have been slowly moving up market for a while now and losing their dependence on estate cars into the bargain. Now they're part of Ford's premier auto group alongside famous names like Jaguar and Aston Martin, you can expect them to become even posher in the future. Welcome to the lavish world of the Volvo S80 executive. This is Volvo's very first limo for the busy executive. And it's got just about every toy and gadget you can imagine. It's a bit like sitting down at an officer's club. The plushest of leather that would make a Bentley seem uh, modestly embarrassed. Hand-stitched piping. I have, of course, my... Uh, TV screen here, my controls, everything on here from television to a DVD video player, obviously stereophonic sound system, of course for the busy businessman on the move the very latest GSM WAP telephone and of course hidden away in here I have my very own drinks cabinet. As you can see the Volvo lacks for very little, so I think it's time I found out what life's like on the road in the back. Drive on, James. I have to say, this is an exceedingly comfortable way to travel. As you can see, there's bags of room in the back of here, and that's with a driver who's over six foot tall. Um, and apart from the tyre noise, there's really very, very little noise from the engine. You waft along rather serenely in the back of here. It is a first-class way to travel. Another rather nice extra for the chauffeur is an excellent sat-nav system, which uh, will get you to wherever you want to go with the minimum of fuss. Although I have to say, sitting in the back here, it seems to be the minimum fuss, whatever the uh, navigation system. Now, of course, like every really nice boss, I'm going to give the show for the occasional day off so that I can actually enjoy a drive in the car myself, because after all, I am a motoring correspondent. So what's it like? Well, the good news is, it's a pretty solid feeling drive. I don't think you'd want to sort of uh, thrash it around, but it, it feels very composed on the road. And it's certainly got the performance for an Executive Express. 2.8 litre, six cylinder turbocharged engine that's capable of naught to 62 in 7.2 seconds and a top speed of 155 miles an hour. Of course, the chauffeur can lose his license, not you. That's one of the bonuses. So, it delivers plenty of performance. Fuel consumption is not that great, uh, averaging around about 25, 26, and around town as low as 16 to 17. But if you can afford a chauffeur, who cares about the cost of petrol? Like everything, there is, of course, a price to pay for joining the executive car upper class club. 
a cool £44,783 in the S80 executive's case, which shows that Volvo have very quickly got the hang of executive pricing. I tell you what, I think the boys from Volvo have done a rather good job with this. For a first attempt at a sort of executive limo, it's impressive. It certainly compares favorably with any of the German rivals. Okay, it hasn't quite got the glamour of the badge or the image, but it lacks nothing that they have. And it's got a few little extras for the price that they definitely don't have. And of course, it's one of the safest cars on the road. The other thing I've decided is, I'm a natural for this backseat driving. I just take it all in my stride. In fact, I'm so impressed, I think I might keep the car and the driver. Drive on, James. After the break on Motor Week, we've got two head-to-head -head tests. Richard Hammond drives the BMW 318i against the Mercedes C-Class, and Glenda Mackay drives the Nissan Primera against the Hyundai Elantra. going to be a bloody one. It's like the hot hatches bicker amongst themselves as to who can shave an extra tenth of a second off the Nauta 60 time. And the big luxury barges bicker of the benefits of certain nerve over a seat massager. But this is where the real battle takes place. Here between these middle class, mid range, middle lane motorway mile munchers. Both reps chariots and both from manufacturers hungry for your tick in the box next to their motor on the company car lists. So we have the BMW 318 SE and facing up to it, still fresh and youthful, the new Mercedes C180, both only a couple of steps up from cooking versions of the basic cars. Mercedes are after BMW's championship belt and they look like they mean business. They both look great, both are hand carved from one lump of granite and will last thousands of years. Mileages to raise the eyebrow of a spaceship captain will be perfectly achievable without anything ever going wrong. Well, more or less. But we've got to choose between them, so let battle commence. Mercedes used to have a reputation for being incredibly mean. It was all you could do to get a key fob out of them when you bought what is still an expensive car. Now though, they've addressed that and clearly they've been tracking BMW with this, the C-Class, because the spec is very similar. In this fairly basic version, we get pretty much everything you need as standard. I've got a multifunction steering wheel that allows me to control the telephone and the radio and bits and pieces like that. A fairly elaborate and clever automatic climate control. Cruise control is standard. They have their stability control system to keep things on the straight and narrow. And so to the BMW 318, where we get, oh look, cruise control and automatic climate control and elaborate stereo. It does feel sharp and eager, but it doesn't exactly feel exciting. In this lesser powered version, it feels perhaps a little bit numb. The gearbox isn't exactly exhilarating. We've only got five speeds as opposed to the six in the Mercedes C-Class. It probably doesn't feel as sharp as the BMW. Mercedes seldom do. But considering it is a small Mercedes, it is a huge improvement on old ones and still a good car to drive. The huge discounts given to big corporate buyers are, of course, denied the humble private buyer, but that's another story. The result is that though margins may be squeezed to the bone, the numbers sold are huge. For what it's worth, not that many people will be digging into their own pockets to buy these things, the BMW costs £20,130 in this form. Bear in mind it is slightly better equipped than the Mercedes C180 Classic, which chips in at a slightly more weighty £20,740, both on the road. The BMW is still excellent. It looks great, it's still good to drive, it's got everything you need on board. The problem is, quite a lot of people seem to agree with you, and the old blue and white propeller badge is in danger of becoming a victim of its own success. They made them so good, everybody bought the things, and now, well, in some parts of the world, they could be seen as a little bit common.
Oh dear. Whereas the Mercedes, well, that's an entirely different prospect. Pitching up for your four o'clock in Wigan, peering at the world through the three-pointed star at the end of the bonnet, might just help you stand out from the crowd a little. Sure, it's not ultimately as fast and sharp handling as the BMW, but the payoff is less crashing suspension and a far more comfortable ride. Half a million BMW 3 Series were sold a couple of years ago in 1999. That's a lot. Now, it might deny you any chances of exclusivity, but it is an indication that BMW must be doing something right. With their new C-Class, Mercedes want those sales. If not all of them, then quite a lot of them. And they deserve them. We'll see what happens. Image. It's got a disproportionate effect on how we go about choosing a car. And two manufacturers that have suffered more than most are Nissan and Hyundai. The previous generation Primera from Nissan always had a good enough chassis to compete with the class leading Mondeo, but suffered from very dull styling. The Lantra was a smaller car, but has grown up with this generation and gained an E just to prove the point. They claim the new Elantra is as good as anything in this market sector, but are people ready to accept that a Hyundai can be as good as a Ford or a Vauxhall, let alone the likes of VW's Passat? From a styling point of view, both still suffer from chronic understatement. Nissan have boasted about the bold styling on the new Primera, but from some angles you'd be hard pressed to work out that it's a Nissan at all, without the aid of badging. The Elantra is a little more grown up than the previous generation, which definitely looked a little toy town. That said, it still blends into the crowd, which Hyundai can ill afford if they wish to break away from their staid image. Inside the Primera, you fall very low into this driver's seat, which in the sports version actually supports you in all the right places. In the back there, it isn't quite as roomy as you would expect for a car that takes up this much road space. The boot benefits from the passenger's misfortune with a large flat load space. Ahead, the dashboard is well laid out and free from clutter. It's not very adventurous in its design though. And with this very low driving position and high scuttle, even the tallest of driver is gonna have trouble seeing the bonnet. And to be honest, I can't even see it at all. And in the back, there's a really large blind spot in the rear three quarters, which is going to make parking this car really, really difficult. Parking is made even more difficult by this car's abysmal turning circle. But you learn the reason why when you get the car on the move, because this Primera is continuing in the previous model's success by being a fine driver's car. The steering wheel doesn't give much feedback through the rim, but it's only a few turns lock to lock, and that makes progress much swifter down these country lanes. The gear stick is only a short throw, and it's actually quite a delight to use. At speed, the engine stays a distant hum, being overshadowed by wind and road noise. This is all comparatively talking, as the sound deadening keeps these noises to a background hum rather than a real problem. The engine in this model produces 140 brake horsepower. It likes to be revved to get the best from it, but in the mid-range it packs a decent punch. The Nissan is quite a worthy drive then, but it's going to have to work pretty hard to get rid of that rather dull image. But the Elantra is going to have to work even harder because it's got to raise its game from being really rather lacklustre to being a serious contender of the fleet favourite Vectra. Stepping inside the cabin, it's a much more inviting place to be than that of the more established Nissan. And on this model, we've got leather seats, which give a much more inviting aroma. The dashboard is uncluttered and understated, and it's only these fiddly stereo controls that spoil the ergonomics. But tap on the dash and you get that annoying, wrapping, hard plastic sound, which somehow detracts from the aura of quality in here. And it's not made up for by all of this fake wood around the place. But saying all of that, this is a vast improvement on the interior of the outgoing Lantra.
The first thing that hits you when you start to drive is this much better visibility in this car. The scuttle is much lower, which means I can actually see some of the bonnet. There's still that rear three-quarter blind spot, though, and you'd have to be really tall to see the end of the boot when you're reversing. As you pull away, you realise that this car has got more lower rev grunt than the rather peaky Primera. And as you drive it more, you realise that this engine is quite a peach. And with plenty of power and the willingness to rev, add into the appeal. Handling is not up to Primera standards, but few cars are. And the Elantra does not object to being hustled along. The ride quality is a little more relaxed, but road and engine noise is markedly louder than the Nissan though. Overall, the Elantra is quite impressive. Any conceptions about dodgy dynamics can be quickly dispelled. And the moral of this feature is, if there is one, make sure that you go beyond the looks, the style and the badge when you're considering buying a new car. And take a look at some of these underrated bargains. Recently on Motorweek, Chris Goffey went to the European launch of the Peugeot 206 CC. Well, next week, Linda McKay will be seeing how the same car gets on in the moorlands of Yorkshire.